is cultivator motivation. So the uh, great practitioners of mind training have a very unusual way of looking at things. Unusual from our, according to our ordinary perspective, where we look at uh, what benefits ourselves as uh, good and what harms us as bad. And these practitioners have a very profound understanding of karma and of the paths and stages to awakening so they know what uh, kind of changes have to be affected in the mind to gain realizations. So these practitioners, for example, uh, will think suffering is okay. It's not, it's not bad. In fact, there's many benefits to suffering. I develop my compassion, I purify my negative karma. So suffering is not something bad. Of course, they don't go out and look for it. But when it comes, you know, they don't freak out. And But then they also think, oh, but when I have pleasure, that's not so good. Because if I have too much pleasure and I get attached to it, I lose my spiritual direction, and I also uh, use up all my virtuous karma, just enjoying the pleasure. And so they see that, you know, that if you're really sincere on the path, suffering can advance you on the path, while having a lot of pleasure and happiness can actually be detrimental. So they're not masochistic, yeah. but uh, they've transformed their minds in this way so that whatever they experience, they can take it into the path. So when they uh, say that you know, happiness is not so good when you're a practitioner because it makes you use up, consume all your virtuous karma. I was thinking it's really true. Uh, we take for granted our good circumstances, that we have food and a place to stay and we're safe and, you know, all the conditions around that. We take that for granted. And even if we wake up to the extent of not taking it for granted, but at least appreciating it, still that mind of appreciation of our fortune uh, is better than taking it for granted, but it's not a particularly virtuous thought. Yeah, because it's just saying, wow, I'm fortunate, yippee. The thing to do when we have good conditions is to rejoice at our merit. So it's important that we rejoice at our merit, that we rejoice at the merit that other people create. And then by rejoicing, uh, we get more inspired to practice and to create more virtue, create more merit. Yeah, so in response to, to having pleasure, instead of just appreciating it, we should think of its causes and rejoice and then conclude that we want to create more causes like that. So if we don't do that, then, you know, all that good karma is just getting used up and finished and, you know, without a store of virtue underneath us, having a good rebirth and having good uh, conditions for future practice, those things are not going to come about. So 
So it's really important that we transform our minds and orient it with the way the practitioners of mind training think. So that we can actualize our spiritual goals of being of benefit, accomplishing the purpose of self, and accomplishing the purpose of others. So with that kind of motivation, let's share the Dharma this evening. So these uh, mind training practitioners are really something. They uh, have, like our aspirations are, you know, may I have all good conditions, may, you know, everybody appreciate me, may I get all the benefits and opportunities. And uh, and these people pray, um, if it's beneficial for all sentient beings for me to be healthy may I be healthy if it's not beneficial may I be sick if it's beneficial for sentient beings for me to live may I live if it's not beneficial may I die what do you think about that yeah I mean people with so little attachment to their own pleasure, to their own good opportunities, and just completely willing to uh, have whatever is beneficial for sentient beings in the long run, to have that ripen upon them. Are we ready to think like that? You know, even if we're not ready to think like that, we should practice in our meditation thinking like that. Not just say, oh, it's too hard. But, you know, really sit with it and try and think like that. Work our mind into that way of thinking. It's like with the ten jewels of the Kadampas, you know, where it talks about, uh, you know, about death and dying alone and having our body decay and nobody even knowing we died and nobody doing anything with our body and no memorial service, no little cards with a picture of us and, you know, everything and a prayer on the back of it and not everybody coming together and telling stories about us and crying because we aren't there. But, you know, just dying in a cave somewhere, you know, somewhere nobody even knows you're dead. I'm being completely happy. Yeah. So when you read these ten innermost jewels of the Kadampas, you know, sometimes you go, oh my God, you know. But it's good just to, to think about them and practice, you know, kind of what would it be like that if, the Dharma meant so much to me, you know, and awakening was such a strong aspiration in me that I could truthfully, uh, you know, say what corresponds with those ten innermost jewels. And so practice just thinking that way and what it would be like. Because if we don't practice, we'll never get there. So, uh, but it's really something to think about how these these practitioners do it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's very good practice because we don't know what we're going to experience in our life. You know, when you think of all the monks and nuns in China and in Tibet, and they had no idea what they were going to experience after 
the communist takeover and during the cultural revolution. You know? And then all of a sudden it hit and they were faced with these horrific um, conditions. And then the people who had inner strength through practicing before survived. And the people who didn't have that inner strength just crumbled and died in those situations. Yeah. So it's quite uh, amazing to read the, the stories of some of these people, yeah, or to meet them. Okay. So um, a number of you sent me your emails um, with email. Uh, you know, about the, the homework from last time, thinking about the various kinds of awarenesses that manifested. And uh, some people included the different mental factors that were there, too. And uh, so that's very good. And you, you were really, um, you know, applying what you learned. Uh, it's important to remember that every time we make a syllogism, that is not inference. Inference has to be understanding derived from a correct syllogism. So just saying, uh, you know, um, uh, I uh, I am open to make mistakes because I've seen myself make lots of mistakes in the past. Yeah. Or I could make a mistake because I've made lots of mistakes in the past. But, you know, that's, that's not a correct syllogism. That's not an inference. Okay. It's our mind making a reason for thinking the way we think. Yeah, but just having a reason doesn't mean it's a a reliable syllogism and a, and a, and a correct inference, okay? Because remember when we were talking about correct assumers, many of those had reasons too. It's just that the reasons were too broad or the reasons were contradictory or the reasons didn't pertain, okay? So just just remember that when when you're doing you know when you're looking at your different mental states okay so uh you know that time cuz we spent a long time going through our syllogisms about um you know i am incapable because of blah blah you remember you know we spent weeks doing this kind of thing so those w was practicing making syllogisms. But as we saw, most of those were not reliable inferences. They were wrong consciousnesses. Okay. Yeah. So just, just kind of remember that. Yeah. Um, what else? Then, uh, okay, then Venerable Tarpa sent something about... Um, oh, we were talking about the different um, qualities of a, uh, you know, of inference, the different types of inference and the qualities of inference. Okay, so where is it? Oh, it hasn't downloaded that yet, so it's sinking. <laughs> Clock. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, term generalities. Okay. Okay. So, um, it's pretty much what we talked about last time, but it's good to go over. Um, okay. So it's focusing on the definition of inferential cognizers through belief. Um, what we also call, uh, you know, inferences through authoritative st testimony. Okay, um, but here, calling it through belief is actually, because uh, belief doesn't mean we've ascertained anything. So it's a determinative knower, which means it must ascertain the object. 
It's a determinate knower, which, depending on its basis, a correct sign uh, of belief is incontrovertible with regard to its object of comprehension, a very hidden phenomena. Okay, an illustration is the inferential consciousness that realizes um, the scriptural citation from giving resources from ethics a happy migration is incontrovertible with respect to the meaning indicated by it. Okay, so where does, uh, what text does that uh, come? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the phrase from giving resources from ethics a happy migration, what text is that from? From Precious Garland. Okay, so remember that because it'll come up a lot. So they always use that as an example. And it's a good example. And they still haven't come to a conclusion. But anyway. Um, okay. So uh, last time I talked about some of the qualities of an authoritative testimony um, of this inference. Uh, I left out the, the, um, the beginning part of it, okay? So what to, to see if it's a valid scripture, okay, then you have to have three things. And I talked about the two meanings of the third one last time and didn't speak of the first two. So the first one is that that scripture doesn't uh, contradict evident phenomena. So remember, evident phenomena are things that you can know without an inference. Yeah, so it doesn't contradict them. Then second, it doesn't contradict um, hit slightly obscure objects, which mean objects that the first time you, you ascertain them has to be through uh, an inference. The first time you realize them has to be through an inference by power, by a factual inference. Okay, so that covers, so we've covered it doesn't contradict evident phenomena. It doesn't contradict slightly obscure phenomena. Then the third condition is it doesn't contradict the very uh, obscure phenomena. Okay. Now, to see that one, if it doesn't contradict very obscure phenomena, that's when the two things I mentioned last time come into play. One, that um, the the earlier and later parts of the scripture don't contradict each other, and the other that the implicit and explicit um, passages don't contradict. Okay? So, um, yeah. Oh, yeah, so the two parts are the former and latter passages don't contradict each other. And that explicit and implicit meanings don't contradict each other. Okay. But just ascertaining those three things, you know, just knowing those three things will prove to you that that scripture is reliable. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you have understood that scriptural, that you have realized that scriptural passage. Okay. Because, uh, you know, it, it's, I think it takes more than just proving to yourself that the scripture is reliable to actually grok the meaning of the um of the passage. Let's go on. We were at choosing your debate partner. Okay. So, the first lesson of interactive debate is to choose well your opponents. Yeah, somebody who's really dumb that I can beat. Um, no. And what he's going to show here is that that's not the kind of person that you want to choose for your debate partner. Okay. So most 
most people are not worthy debate partners for a variety of reasons. First, they must be rational. How many people are rational? Second, they must have integrity. Mm -hmm. Third, they must be willing to admit when they are wrong. If any of these qualities are missing, there's little point in trying to debate with the person. Because they can't hear anything. They're stuck in their own viewpoint. They will keep fighting even when they know that what they're saying isn't true, isn't correct. Okay, they'll make up reasons that are ridiculous. Uh, yeah. So part of this is not just so we can choose good debate partners, but so that we can make ourselves into good debate partners. Yeah. Or at least make ourselves into uh, human beings that other people can talk to. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Don't you think that's that's good to make ourselves into you know human beings that other people can talk to, you know, and have a decent conversation with without feeling frustrated and angry and you know or whatever. Yeah, so we have to, we should make ourselves into that kind of person. Yeah, otherwise, you know, it, you can see, you know, some people start to talk to you, and after a while they just get so frustrated they walk away. So one time, Demolocha Rinpoche told a story from the old days at Losa Ling College of Drepung Mon Monastic University in Tibet. The monastery was vast, with as many as 14,000 monks. Uh, yeah, it was huge. Drepung was the largest of the three seats. Yeah. Oh, it just vanished. We realized emptiness. <laughs> the screen just, um, oh, okay, there we are. Okay, so the monastery was vast with as many as 14,000 monks, and by no means did all the monks study and debate. In fact, as he told it, there was a group of monks, sometimes known as monk guards, or fighting monks, and they were called the dope dopes. He put dop dope here, you know, but we, my teachers always called them the dope dope. So they were these big guys, you know, and they'll wear uh, something like football padding on their shoulders, except sometimes they'll put a wooden board there, you know, to make their shoulders look bigger. And they'll walk around with a big stick and look really fierce. And um, they were supposed to be like the disciplinarians, but often, as my teachers tell it, they were the thugs of the monastery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, well, they were known as monk guards or fighting monks called the dope topes, who would choose to carry stones up a mountainside rather than study. Okay, so, you know, these are the, the guys who weren't so interested in the study. Still, sometimes they would end up in a discussion on a question of the Dharma. When they would disagree because of not understanding, Locha Rinpoche reported that they would remind them of the saying, don't bang your head against the wall and don't debate with Geshe's. Well, my mother told me the first part of that, don't bang your head against the wall, but she didn't tell me don't debate with Geshe's. But um, the meaning of it is, you know, that the Geshe's are, uh, they know what they're doing, and, you know, they're rational, and they have integrity, and they'll admit when they're wrong. Uh, so that, you know, if the dope dubs try and discuss anything with them, they're, they're going to lose that. Okay. <laughs> But I tell you, sometimes Geshe's can be stubborn. <laughs> I worked at the really stubborn Geshe once. If an, <laughs> yeah. if an opponent is not competent, yeah, it was, I was so, it was very difficult working with them. And I happened to, um, 
Yeah, and I, I hadn't, you know, put those words together in my in my mind, you know, kind of, this is a very stubborn Geshe. And I was just remarking to, to one other person, uh, a Tibetan man that I knew, um, you know, that, uh, you know, that was difficult with this person. And he looked at me and he said, you know, some of those Geshe's are really stubborn. And he had worked with a lot of them. <laughs> So that was very uh, soothing, <laughs> you know. It's like, oh, it wasn't just me, <laughs> you know. Most geshis aren't like that, you know. I mean, most of my teachers are all completely jovial, and and you know. Anyway, I shouldn't get off on gossip about geshis. Sounds like a new radio pra- program. <laughs> If an opponent is not competent in rational procedures, then there is little point in trying to engage that person in debate. In my own limited experience on the debating courtyard with Tibetan youngsters, I saw that there were some young monks who who most would refuse to debate with. This is because they were not able to get on with it. They had not developed their skill in rational discourse. So they would just give answers, shots in the dark, without rhyme or reason. Eventually, they would drop out of the program of studies and pursue other interests, such as cooking or working as a tailor, which are still important. And so the way the the um, curriculum is arranged in these big monasteries is, you know, everybody starts out doing the philosophical debate program, but Clearly, that is not meant for everybody, yeah? And I think that it would be really good if there were more opportunities and different ways for people to to engage with the Dharma in the big monasteries. Because what happens is that the people who are not interested in that way of study, uh, yeah, they'll just drop out of the program or they'll cook. They'll, they'll become the administrators, or tailors, or artists, and, you know, their jobs are extremely important, and they sustain the monastery. But I always look at it and think, oh, it's too bad that there's not another program of study that is better suited for their aptitude, that there's only this way, or, you know, that's it. But anyway, that's how they organize their monasteries. Okay. Um... And so that actually, this is one reason why the Tibetans uh, always want to ordain a lot of people, okay? Because with the monasteries, to do a good debate program, you need a lot of people. So they want to ordain a lot of monks so that when you debate, you can have a lot of different opinions and different views and so on. And then gradually, you know, uh, I guess what do you get the cream from the whey or the flack from the grain or I don't know you get it out. yeah you know it's it separates out so yeah yeah so that you have um, you know there's some people who this really suits them and they're very smart and successful, and they go ahead with it. And then other people where this kind of education is really not so suitable for them, you know. Um, but they, so this is one reason why in the last few years they haven't been having so many young monks ordained in the monasteries, and it's been very concerning to them because you need this for the debate program, yeah. And uh, and then, of course, uh, you ordain them when they're quite young. And in Tibet, that was no problem. You know, they went through teenage years into young adult. They usually stayed with the ordination. And if they didn't like the program, you know, then they served the monastery or whatever, and that was fine. But nowadays, there's so many things outside the monastery that glitter that... Um, You know, a lot of them late teens, early 20s, some of them even after that, then, uh, you know, they disrobe because they they want to go for the glitter. And one warning is uh, often 
the method they take is to meet a Western woman and fall in love, and then she takes them back to the West and, you know, and so on and so forth. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so this is something that, that's uh, a difficulty in the monasteries, you know, at this particular time. Because now the, the young ones have much, uh, you know, they have a choice of different things, what they can do. And many of my teachers say that it used to be uh, in old Tibet, if you had many uh, sons, you would send the brightest one to the monastery. Now in exile, they send their brightest one to secular school or to sell sweaters or to do something, you know, to make money for the family. And then they send the next son to the monastery. Yeah. I don't know about the daughters. Many of the daughters, uh, uh, even when they ordain in the Himalayan areas, uh, the the girls ordain and then they become unpaid uh, help at home, you know, in Ladakh, Sanskar, you know, Kanaar, these kind of areas. Um, yeah, there's not a lot of uh, nunneries, and so they ordain and then they stay at home and cook and clean for the family. So that's why. You know, what's happened in the last few decades with His Holiness's encouragement is so important um, because now there's places that the nuns can go and actually get a good education and good training. And now we also have some Gishimas. Yeah. So he's saying, you know, people who, who you know, debate is just not their thing. They don't like rational discourse. You know, they won't think of good arguments. They'll just kind of say anything. And so the debates don't really go anywhere. And so some people avoid debating with them. Okay, so skill and rational discourse, first quality. Second, people worthy of debating with should have integrity. They should be sincere and honest in the undertaking. For instance, if someone is constantly changing the report of what was said earlier, how can you proceed? <laughs> there, there is no use trying to build on shifting sands. The ideal is when both opponents are sincere in trying to work together to figure out what is real, to establish what is true and defensible. Okay? So that sure makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? You know, having a partner and ourselves being somebody who is sincere and having integrity, you know. If we don't do that, and even an ordinary discussion, yeah, have you ever had a discussion with somebody and they say something at the beginning of the discussion and then two minutes later they say something that contradicts what they said and when you say something about it, they say, no, I didn't contradict myself. <laughs> you ever had that happen? Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever been the person who does it? No. But have you ever had it happen? Yes. Then I wonder who are these people are who do that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so integrity. Then third, whoops. Okay. Then third, worthy opponents must be willing to admit errors. The Oh, no. <laughs> Admit an error? No, never. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do we do when we make a mistake? You know, or when somebody asks a question we can't answer. We change the topic. We humiliate the other person and tell them that their question is stupid. We, um, what else do we do? We give an answer that doesn't pertain to what they ask. Yeah. But never do we say, oh, I made a mistake. Never. You know, that would get you arrested by the, 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 the FBI on the, what is it, the, um, something for, yeah. Anyway, you'll get tried for 
you know, and executed for treason or something. You never say you're wrong. In America, it's true, isn't it? Yeah, people don't like to admit their mistakes. Oh, you're all very quiet. You'll never agree with what I say on this. <laughs> Do you admit your mistakes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's our answer. What mistakes? Okay. Okay. Um, it, the basic procedure in Buddhist reasoning and debate is to describe a position for which the consequences are compatible and acceptable. If the consequences of your position contradict what you said, there is something wrong with your position. Thus, worthy opponents will have to be able to accept that their position is faulty. Tupton Jimpa Langri, a Geshe of the Shartse College of Gandhan Monastic University, said that when a debater is defeated because of having misunderstood a point, but then comes to understand it better, a good monk will thank the opponent who defeated him. This is integrity. It is not about winning the debate. It is about being right or wrong in the real world. And I would say it's, uh, it's not even about being right or wrong in the, the real wor world. It's about learning. Yeah, it's about learning. And so if somebody shows you your error in thinking, then we should be appreciative. Yeah, because if we go through our life, you know, holding some kind of wrong view, uh, who's going to get hurt by that? Yeah, we're the ones who are going to suffer. In modern day America, at least, we have an unfortunate tendency to value aggression over rationality. Really? Yeah. Do you think so? You're all so quiet. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You can see this in television, movies, games, and life, and politics, can't you? Thus, attempting to actually engage in debate can, be, can sometimes be risky. I have seen and experienced many times that one person will express a view Another will question or deny that view. The first will simply repeat what was said earlier. The second will question or deny it again. And then the first will respond with hostility. We are building a wall. No, we are not building a wall. We are building a wall. We need a wall. We are building a wall. No, we're not building a wall. I'm going to do you know, inv invoke, what is it he's going to do? Um, executive privilege so he can, you know, get the money from outer space and because I'm going to build a wall. <clears throat> so, I mean, this is just an example, but it, it fits what he's describing here, doesn't it? And, and so, so often our discourses with each other are like that, you know? Why? The spatula wasn't put where it belongs. Uh, yes, it was. Uh, the spatula wasn't put where it was. Long. It was there. I put it there exactly where it belongs. The spatula was not put where it belongs. What are you getting on my case about? Look, I put the spatula away, you idiot. And so on and so forth, okay? Do you ever have conversations like that? <laughs> you get tired of the spatula and then it was you know this what oh the bucket oh yeah the bucket for the for the water from the offerings from the meditation hall where you put that bucket the mop bucket oh okay because I wonder about the bucket for the offerings. You put it where the shoes are, and I don't think it belongs there. <laughs> yeah. I don't care where the mop bucket goes, but, you know, this other bucket that you put where the shoes belong. 
And then there's no place to put our shoes. Many students who have completed this course have reported that when they tried to apply the procedures with friends and roommates, the others would just get angry. <laughs> one, of my, one of my friends who, uh, as a layperson, went to IBD and did most of the program, he couldn't go to Drepung because he wasn't a monk, um, so he, could, he couldn't get a skeshi. But he told me, you know, he was doing this program, and in the middle of the program, he got a, he had a girlfriend, and he said he just got so used to the debate way of saying things that that's the way he spoke to his girlfriend, and it didn't work. <laughs> and you know, yeah. How nice it would be if they, too, had the tools to proceed. Then we could get somewhere. But if they don't, don't waste your time and be careful. Okay, so just walk away and knock the bucket over and, you know, put your shoes where you want. And then somebody will move them and then you have to look for them again. Okay, and then your shoes are in the bucket. Or your bucket or in the shoe. <laughs> okay, then, uh, card carriers and truth seekers. Sometimes, even when people are civil, there is little point in engaging in debate with them. A friend of mine who is a great philosopher and college professor told a story about a student who had come by his office to engage him in a discussion about creationism versus evolution theory. The student was a fundamentalist Christian whose position was settled according to the biblical narrative. My friend is very interested in the philosophy of science and knows a tremendous amount about biology and evolution theory. Their discussion went on for over two hours, and he made no headway in convincing this young man that there may be some merit in evolution theory. No appeal matured into any fruit. When he told me this story, I simply said, I don't think you chose your opponent well. Actually, at the time, I think this comment irritated him a little. I went on to praise him for his integrity in seeking the truth that corresponds to the facts in the real world, at least to the extent that we are able to observe what is real and his willingness to engage in a sincere uh, exchange between truth seekers. Years later, he said that the comment about choosing opponents well was some of the best advice he had ever received, and it had saved him countless hours that would have been wasted. So that's something that I've learned too, especially about religion. Uh, if somebody wants to have a sincere discussion, like our Catholic sisters, friends, it's wonderful. You can have a wonderful discussion and everybody benefits. But sometimes there are people who don't want to discuss. They want to talk at you. And as soon as I sense that in a person, I get out of the, the conversation, you know. It's harder when you're sitting next to them on an international flight, but you try. <laughs> yeah. I think of this story as an encounter between a card carrier and a truth seeker. Usually when we use the phrase card carrier, it is about someone who is a confirmed member of some group, like a card-carrying communist or a card-carrying Republican. This is probably not literally true. There may be card-carrying party members. I'm not sure, but I think this is modeled after people who are card-carrying electricians, plumbers, and so forth. That is, people who have earned certification in a trade. That is one sense of a card carrier, but not the sense in which I mean it. What I am thinking of here is suggested by the philosopher philosopher. Ludwig Wittgenstein in his stratosphere, stratospheric critique of a very common model of the relationship between thinking and language use. So here's what he, Wittgenstein said. 
When I hear the word red with understanding, a red image should be before my mind's eye. But why should I not substitute seeing a red bit of paper for imagining a red patch? The visual image will only be the more vivid. Imagine a man always carrying a sheet of paper in his pocket on which the names of colors are co uh, coordinated with colored patches. We could perfectly well, for our purpose, replace every process of imagining by a process of looking at an object or by painting, drawing, or modeling. Okay. In the way I am applying this example, a card carrier understands a new thought only by comparing it to the cards that certify what he or she has already settled on. Okay, so that's what he's meaning. There is no imagining what may be tree, true, only a process of modeling after what is known to be true, according to that person. If the new thought is compatible with the cards, then probably what that thought is true if a new thought is not compatible with the cards, it is not true. It is just that simple. In effect, this approach is, if this new thought agrees with what I already believe, it is true. And if it disagrees with what I believe, I know it is false. Well, that sounds totally reasonable. That's the way I think. <laughs> Unless you yourself are the Lord of all truth... Getting there. Uh, this, this is an approach without integrity. It denies the possibility that at least in this area for which I have cards, there may be things I believe that are not true. Yeah. So this is a very good point here. You know, how much... Uh, are we open-minded and can take in new information and think about it freshly? And how much does everything new we learn get filtered through what we already know? And if it makes sense in terms of what we already know, it's good. If we can't make sense of it, then we just, uh, you know, close the book, turn off that, you know, go to another web page, whatever it is. Okay, so you know, what is our degree of open-mindedness and genuine curiosity about how things exist? I had an interesting discussion recently. Um, somebody uh, called me about, you know, they wanted some advice, and. Uh, they were they were talking about following their they were affiliated with a big dharma group and they talked about following it um like it was a brand yeah you know like this group um you know it had its name it had its brand he's he called it starbucks buddhism um <laughs> you know <laughs> that that you have uh yeah, that is like you always go to Starbucks for your coffee, you know, so you don't think about other places, you don't investigate other things, you always just go to what's familiar. And so he was talking about it in that way of, uh, you know, kind of the, this is familiar, so you start, stop thinking, you stop investigating, and, uh, you know, that's your brand, and so, or it has a brand, and you like that brand, so you just keep going back um, out of familiarity. Okay. So this is not to say that going back to the same thing is not good, because very often it's quite good, because that is what allows you to go deeper into something, is because you keep going back. But there is, what it's pointing out is there's different reasons for going back to a group or a teacher or whatever. There's one reason where you just do it because it's familiar and that what's, what it feels comfortable to you and you don't want to shake it. 
And then there's another reason where you go back because you're really benefiting from that approach and it's really helping you to go deeper. Yeah. And so I think what he was pointing out when we were talking or what I tried to point out as we were conversing is, you know, we have to see what our, what's going on in our mind and what our motivation is. Yeah. Otherwise, um, we can get quite stuck, you know, you get stuck in a dharma rut. Yeah. So I'm not telling you all to go out and start reading, you know, Rosicrucian stuff tomorrow. You know, I'm not, yeah, not this. But, but just, um, uh, you know, to make sure that our dharma mind is uh, always a fresh mind. You know, that we keep it as a fresh mind as much as possible. Maybe that's what the Zen people mean when they say um, beginner's mind, see everything with a beginner's mind, okay? So that you may go to the same teacher, you may hear the same teaching that you've heard many times before, but you approach it with a new mind, and so you benefit uh, from it because your approach is quite open, yeah? And that's very different than just going uh, like, uh, well, I've heard this before, so it's not going to say anything that shakes me up. And I know, you know, how this group functions, and I know this, and I know that, so I just keep, you know, going back. And then you don't really think about the teaching. Yeah, because if you went to a teaching and it doesn't, you know, make you think or shake up something inside, uh, then... You know, we're missing out, okay? You know, if, if you say, oh, well, I've heard that teaching so many times before, I don't need to go, yeah? So if we have that kind of mind, like, oh, it's just old hat, I know it already, then even if we go, for sure we're not going to get anything out of it. But if we have a mind that is, you know, Zen mind, beginner's mind, um, you know, then you go for this teaching and and even you know it all, the points already, you come out with something new to think about. I think this relates really to how, um, I, when I have that mind, I think often comes from the way we're schooled um, in the secular world to receive knowledge. You go to class to learn something new, to pass a test or whatever. So when you hear the same thing again, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, what? <laughs> Who has told you that you're here in class to benefit sentient beings? <laughs> Right? Like you're studying for a whole different motivation that you can't even conceive. Right? Yeah. So you show up and you're like, ah. The yeah. teacher's like trying to tell you something that will liberate you. It's like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, if you listen to Dharma talks with just the same old thing of, you know, I'm here for information and they're saying the same old thing. Yeah. I remember a few years ago, somebody sent me a transcript of, um, you know, what uh, Lama Zopa had been teaching at that time. And I started reading the transcript, and I'm going, this is exactly what he was talking about 20 years ago, you know? And why is he saying the same thing? Because we still haven't understood it. Yeah? So it's important that I read this. Yeah, even though it's so much, you know, like what he was uh, talking about before. Mm -hmm. I think it's very interesting. You said you have to know your motivation. So we have to be able to look at ourselves when trying to determine the truth of something. It's not enough to just say, oh, is this rational? Because there's all these assumptions that we carry. Mm -hmm. And we have to look at that. We have to go deeper. And then there's going to be a lot of s sort of denial or... Um, you know, we're not going to be completely forthcoming because the self-centered thought, it wants to protect itself. It wants to hide. So, yeah. you know, if I've noticed that some teachings, they make me uncomfortable. So I'm like, that's not true. But then I'm going to base, <laughs> you know, or I'm going to be believing something not based on reason, but based on this like emotional thing. So, yeah. you know, getting at the truth, it's not just facts it's also you have to know how your mind works which yeah. adds this whole another level of complexity yeah yeah and some people 
choose their religion according to what makes them feel good emotionally, not according to uh, really examining the tenets and thinking about what is true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Somebody once commented to me that Buddhism is not a, a great religion to comfort you when you know somebody you love has died. You know? Because it's 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 not. I mean, you 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 can as a Buddhist comfort somebody who's lost a deceased one and make them feel better. But that's not the time to teach them the Dharma because Talking about the fundamental things of the Dharma is not going to help somebody who just lost a, a relative. Yeah. So, uh, so some people, you know, it's like, okay, you know, I heard that kind of stuff and it doesn't make me feel good. So I want to go to some religion that makes me feel good. Yeah. So there's a variety of religions, and, you know, people have. People will choose what is suitable for them according to where they're at. And as long as they try and practice the ethics and the love and compassion that are taught by that religion, then that's okay. This topic makes me think of things that we, um, quote, put on the back burner. Like Uh sometimes we come against ideas that we have resistance to or that and a lot of times that's because we don't understand. And so we put them on the back burner rather than um, take a, a approach of saying, this is wrong because I don't understand it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then we come to those again later and they make sense. Yeah. And if we, I think part of that is being able to admit that there's things I don't know. That's why I am seeking yeah. knowledge because I don't have it. Yeah. And there's things that I won't understand right now. Not only just things I don't know, but things that I really I'm not able to understand right now. And so instead of throwing them out, just accepting that. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm saying is that yeah. our scope of our mind is not ready for that. Yeah. When my sister um uh, converted from Christianity to Buddhism, I asked her why. <laughs> and she said, um, as she started lo- learning a bit about Buddhism, she realized that she stayed in Christianity um, and taught herself not to ask questions. Mm. And when she came upon something where questions were... Um, uh, okay, and you know, welcomed. Yeah, welcomed. Then it really opened that whole place up in her mind yeah. where she just kept putting it back, you know, and not asking. Yeah, it's interesting. That's good. I actually find it very comforting about this uh, concept of rebirth because mm. uh, I, uh, I have very strong feeling like with my grandmother that. I don't have to see her again this life because I know I will see her again because the connection is so strong. Mm-hmm. And this life, there's no way that I can really benefit her because you know, she's on her way out. Mm-hmm. So that um, it's, for me, it's very comforting. Mm-hmm. Like with many people that like, I don't have to see them again this life. Because mm-hmm. there is, that you, I, I can feel that connection that it, the next life I will it will be different people yeah but we will meet again yeah and hopefully you'll be able to be of greater benefit to them in a future life yeah because right now you know i can't and then she she can't receive and and then you know just keep it cordial and you know yeah yeah, it's very nice outfit you know (laughs) yes that's the the best that she could do Uh (laughs) right yeah that's good that's good you know that she feels it's a nice outfit She'll be attracted to it in a future life. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she said. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I've get complimented on my outfit before. Not by not by my relatives, but from other people. <laughs> oh. <laughs> As opposed to card carriers, they're truth seekers. 
who proceed on the assumption that there are things they do not know and there may be things they believe that are not true. One goal of a truth seeker is to find the truth. As Thomas Jefferson once wrote of the University of Virginia, here we are not afraid to follow truth wherever it may lead, except to the end of slavery. He didn't go that far. At its best, this is true open-minded inquiry with integrity. This does not mean that if you are a card carrier in regard to some understanding, then you don't have integrity. However, if omniscience or knowledge of all things is possible, as Buddhists believe, and you have not yet achieved it, then there are things left to learn, and the approach of a truth seeker might be conducive to that effort. Okay. Now, one of the problems that arises is that in almost every case, card carriers will claim to be truth seekers. I believe they are not being deceitful. Sometimes they think that they are open-minded, when actually they are not. More typically, they think that they are truth seekers because they have found the truth, which is on a card in their pockets. <laughs> And they found it because they are truth seekers. In any case, for card carriers, real investigation has stopped. Part of having integrity is trying to understand when you have settled on an established truth about something and no further investigation is needed, and when you have settled on something that may not be final. Distinguishing these two circumstances requires a lot of introspection and can be devilishly challenging. So he's saying part of it depends on if you are smart enough to know when you have a correct assumption and when you have uh, uh, just uh, no assumption that it is. It's just an assumption, not necessarily correct. When you have a correct assumption, when you have an inference, yeah. And, and often we can't distinguish between those in our mind because our basic premise is, if I think it, it's true. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Ah. As far as assumption is good okay, that correct assumption is good enough. So uh, I don't really need to delve into it deeper because it's a little bit too difficult. It makes me think, and yeah. Okay. In nearly four decades teaching in college classrooms, I have observed that the number one obstacle to learning is thinking that you already know. If you already know what need is there to learn, this is like a cup that is already full, so you cannot pour anything more into it. So this is why uh, arrogance and pride are so detrimental for spiritual practice, because with them, we think we already know. Yeah. So that's why the Tibetans say the green grass doesn't grow on the mountaintops. You know, the people who consider them lo themselves lofty or like the mountaintops. But the green grass of understanding doesn't grow there. The green grass grows in the valleys of the people who are humble, who are receptive. Um, one day in his office, Professor James Car Cargyle was talking with me about how there are two kinds of professors of philosophy. Most of them are able to explain topics of philosophy and the writings of some of the greats gone by. But only a few are true original thinkers who can express new thoughts. The abilities of the second type would hopefully indicate a higher standard of true open-mindedness and creative analytical thought. Professor Cargyle's comments are suggested, suggestive of what I am trying to say about card carriers and truth seekers. 
So this is one thing that I have heard sometimes that I, uh, uh, yeah, they say, you know, that the Buddha's teachings are very difficult to understand. So we need the Indian sages and their commentary and traditions. Those are difficult to understand. So we need the Tibetan commentaries on all the philosophical treatises. And those two are, equal, are difficult to understand. So all we need to do is learn the Lamrim. Because in the Lamrim, Tsongkhapa, Lama Tsongkhapa has arranged everything in perfect systematic order. And they make the example of, you know, the Buddha's clothes. You know, it's the difference between having cloth, uncut cloth, and having cloth that's been sewn together and stitched and it's a ready-made outfit and all you need to do is put it on. So sometimes they make this, this seem like, you know, what Tsongkhapa said is your ready-made outfit and all you need to do is learn what Tsongkhapa said in the Lamrim and any further study or questioning is not necessary, you know. And anyway, uh, there's so many great philosophers that in India and in Tibet, and how dare you think that you're a great philosopher, so don't even think of uh, writing a book with your own ideas or trying to say something new because... Uh, you know, you're nowhere near the scale of these other great people. So sometimes there's this attitude, yeah? And we're taught f you should feel so happy that you've met the Lam Rim because that's the ready-made outfit. All you need to do is just learn it, accept it, hook, line, and sinker, and there you go. Yeah? And I think that attitude uh, cuts out our inquis inquisitive mind. Yeah? And we're, you know, and then we feel like, you know, well, Tsongkhapa is great, but, you know, even before Tsongkhapa, you know, Nagarjuna, and <clears throat> you know, even Shantarakshita, even though he was a Yogacharya Svavadjaka, but Yamaka, you know, those guys. But, you know, um, uh, they're still so great that how could, you know, how could I ever question anything they say? That would just be inappropriate of me because I'm a nobody. Yeah? Uh, so I think we have to prevent ourselves from having that kind of attitude, you know? And I think we have to be... Um, very okay with asking questions and asking difficult questions. And what, what I've seen in my studies is that coming from a Western education, we ask questions that Tibetans would not ask. Yeah. And this, for some lamas, they enjoy it. Some lamas don't like that. And some lamas have absolutely no idea what in the world we're saying. Yeah, because it doesn't fit in with how they've, how they've been schooled. Yeah. Um, I'll give you an example. It's a simple example. When we were uh, starting to study uh, ornament of, of clear realizations, then there's 21 commentaries to that text. Yeah. And Hari Bhadra's is the, the best commentary. Yeah. And so you know it's an important text because so many people wrote commentaries on it. And a long discussion about this commentary and that commentary and this author and that author. And the Westerners I was studying with were all scratching their heads and saying, tell us what the text says. And then we'll determine if it's something valuable to listen to. Whereas the traditional approach was, 
look, this was commented on by all these great people, so it must be valuable. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and you should believe it because they commented on it. And we're all going, you know, I don't care. I have no idea who all these people are. Who in the world is Harry Bodger? You know? I, I never heard his name before. How many Harry Bodgers are there, you know, when you look it up on the Internet? And, you know, in my city, you know, how many Harry Bodgers are there? Um, and, you know, anyway, why should I value Harry Bodgers' commentary more than anybody else's? Tell me what these people said, and then I'll think about it, and I'll tell you whether I agree or not. Yeah, so a completely different approach, you know. Uh, I think uh, Kenzer Rinpoche handled it, handled it quite well, but it was, you know, unlike what he had ever encountered before. Western approach might seem very arrogant to maybe the, the Tibetans who, <laughs> yeah, it's like, who are you to judge? Who? But that's how our education system works. Right. And actually the Buddha, he says, test it out yourself. Yeah. So sometimes there can be that tension there and it's difficult to know. Yeah how much to rely on yourself and how much to rely on authority. Yeah, and there's definitely that tension, you know, because as you begin to practice and you begin to see your own arrogance, then you begin to doubt some of those things and think, okay, rather than ask a question, maybe I better keep quiet and see what's going on, you know, test the waters and see what's going on first, you know. So that has some validity but you don't want to go so far that then you don't ask because uh, it's not an acceptable question. I think it's important for us to be able to question even even if what is being said is true because um, if we don't question it, we don't take it from a correct assumption to an inference. Yeah. And so we have to go over it. We're not just saying, oh, this is wrong. But we say, I need to question this and they yeah. want to be able to understand it. I want to it. understand it deeper. Yeah. I think for me, um, what I find most valuable, um, not necessarily I have the acumen to uh, question the scriptures, but what this has led me to is to question my own thoughts. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's incredibly valuable to question what I think about myself, what I think about the world, what, you know, what assumptions I make. And so mm -hmm. to me, that's really where the rubber hits the road, mm -hmm. is looking inward and then, okay. And with other religions, it's not so much that I had not been encouraged to question what they thought, it's that I had not been encouraged to question myself. Mm. And to me, that's kind of what mm. what I find most. To ask yourself, what do I really believe? Right. To yeah, question my own thinking. Yeah. yeah, what makes sense to me. What, yeah. 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 I think that's what this person meant when he was talking about the group having a brand, you know, you just, you don't question, you just, yeah, you go. You see this in Tibetan monasteries too. Most people are learning the positions as set forth in just their own monastic textbooks. That's very true. There are a few scholars who actually go out of their way to read and try and understand the thoughts of other monastic groups and other sects of Buddhism as well. You know, this is not the Tibetan strong point, you know? I mean, even in, within the Galu, reading the Yigcha of, of another Galu monastery, that's a stretch, let alone, you know, learning from the Karge, Nyingma, and Sakya. You know, His Holiness is always encouraging people to be very open. Um, but you know, they, they really ha don't have much interest. And then let alone talking about other kinds of Buddhism, you know, really studying other kinds of Buddhism and appreciating it. So, Don't well, these different colleges have to debate each other so that they would you'd think that they would have to understand each other's yeah, they do. The Within thing. the Galu, they debate each other. But the Galu and the Kargyu don't debate. Yeah. You only debate within... And most of your program is debating within your own monastery. And then when you get to the higher classes, then you'll debate with 
one of the other Galupa monasteries, but I've never heard of the Galupas debating with the Kargus or the Ningmas or the Sakyas. Yeah. I doubt it. Yeah. Because the nuns are mostly trying to copy the program of the monks. So now what's being introduced that's getting them to think outside what they've learned is science. In defense of all the professors of philosophy and Buddhist debaters, it is hard enough just to get this topic straight in your own mind. That is true. You know, just, to, I mean, I just figure, you know, I can't even understand what Jay Rinpoche is saying. Yeah let alone try and understand what some of the other ones are saying. Yeah, so sometimes you get stuck like that. It is another step beyond that to use what you know to create something new, both in European and American philosophy and in the Tibetan monasteries. The number of authors is far fewer than the number of people studying the topics, and this is as it should be. You know, so he, he is saying, yeah, you know, the people, the authors should be people who are quest who are not just card carriers, they're truth seekers. To the extent possible, truth seekers should debate with truth seekers. It is fine for people carrying the same cards to discuss topics with each other, especially within the limits of their own cards. It is a great way to deepen your understanding of those topics. And at the beginning, that's the level we're at. We're just trying to, you know, what in the world is he talking about in this book? Yeah, and we're, we're at that level. And so we've got to master that level before we can think of, you know, what people are talking about in their books. So it's a, it's two things. Okay, statements of belief and rational discourse. All of us have heard, am I at the right place? All of us have heard the old saying about how you should not talk about religion and politics. All too many times, discussions of these topics have led to argument and even bloodshed. And in Europe, every generation, they were killing each other in the name of God. But of course, the entire history of Buddhist reasoning and debate is a history of talking about religion. So the warning should not be heeded all the time. <laughs> One guideline for when it can be safely ignored is when your opponent has the three qualities you should look for in a suitable opponent, rationality, integrity, and the ability to admit errors. As part of integrity, a suitable opponent should be sincere and honest in the debate, actually seeking to develop clarity with an open mind. Okay, so remember that. Rationality, integrity, integrity and the ability to admit mistakes. Thus, despite the old warning, it is clear that discussions about religion and politics can proceed within an atmosphere of civility and mutual respect as long as the circumstances and individuals are appropriate. Another guideline for choosing someone to have rational exchange with is to make sure that you are both engaged in the same activity. In this regard, we should draw a bright line between statements of belief and rational discourse. A statement of belief, such as, I believe in rebirth, says something about the person who spoke the statement. Now we know, as you have said, that you believe in rebirth. However, a statement of belief does not establish the truth of the belief. Okay, so just saying, I believe this, doesn't make it true. On the other hand, rational discourse may lead us to try to understand the justifications for a person's belief. But always bear in mind that not everybody wants to talk about why they believe what they believe. And by no means is everyone qualified to do so. Thus, a statement of belief should not always be taken 
as an invitation to rational discourse. <laughs> yeah. So there's some wisdom in that. You know, somebody says, I believe in, you know, even they're saying something that you believe in. You know, somebody says, I believe in rebirth. Yeah. You might think, oh, they agree in rebirth. We can have an interesting discussion. But then you say, why do you believe in rebirth? And then they give you, you know, reasons that are, you know, out on the moon somewhere, you know. Um, so it, it's not just enough, you know, when somebody says, I believe in rebirth, now you know what they believe, but that doesn't mean that they're going to be a qualified person or have the uh, ability to put into words why they believe what they believe. Yeah. Or that they even have the correct understanding of it. Yeah. I mean, somebody could say, yeah, I believe in rebirth. When we die, we merge back with the great one and then we're reborn from the great one, you know, and, and, you know, or I believe in rebirth and we have different parts of our ancestors' minds combined together to form our mind. Or, you know, who knows what it is. So, um, yeah, so to be careful. So, understand clearly the distinction between statements of belief and rational discourse. When a person supports an assertion with analytical thinking and reasoning, that says something about the assertion. That is, the reasoning relates to the truth of the assertion. However, when someone says something like, I believe in God or I believe in rebirth, these are statements of belief that say something about the persons who believe them, but not necessarily anything about the truth of the assertions. We cannot legislate reality even with fervent votes. <laughs> That's quite smart. Okay, shall we continue? Yeah. A commitment to finding the truth. Recall that in ancient India, there was the custom that if a person lost a debate, the loser would have to convert to the view of the winner. Moreover, if a guru debated with another guru on loss, not only the losing, losing guru, but also all of his disciples too would have to become disciples of the winning guru. Oh my goodness, your reputation is shot. This custom shows a radical commitment to finding the truth, or at least a defensible presentation of truth, over fervent declarations, browbeating, and strong arm tactics. So, yeah, if you got defeated in the debating yard because somebody else has better reasons for a certain belief, then if you're really a truth seeker, you put down your belief and you adopt what makes sense. In line with Indian custom, when Buddhism was first be, uh, becoming established in Tibet during the reign of uh, King Songsen Gampo, circa 240 to nine, uh, 740 to 98, the Tibetans arranged a debate that would set the course for the future of Buddhism in Tibet. So that's incorrect. Sing King Songs and Gampo was the one who had two wives, one Nepali and one Chinese. And so that's how Buddhism first came to Tibet, as the story goes. And he lived 6th century. It was King Tritsong Detsen who lived in the 8th century and who sponsored this big debate at Samye. So he got the names of the kings mixed up here. Okay. So the Tibetans arranged a debate that would set the course for the future of Buddhism in Tibet. This story is told over and over and over again, you know, and it's why the Tibetan view is the right view. And we got rid of Maha, you know, um, Mahayan, yeah. The, the, yeah, Achan, Ash, Hashang, Hashang Mahayan, which basically means Mahayana abbot. 
but nobody really knows what his name is. Okay. And this poor guy is a, you know, is a, uh, he's, um, he's been made into a, uh, yeah, yeah. In this period, there developed some disagreement between Tibetans who felt that they should follow the teachings and practices of Indian Mahayana Buddhism and those who felt that Tibet should follow the teachings and practices of Chinese Chan, the parent of Japanese Zen. Teachers of both traditions were coming to Tibet to help spread the Dharma, but the teachings conflicted on the question of sudden and gradual enlightenment. Actually, there is a way to understand it, sudden and gradual enlightenment, so that they're not so contradictory. Um, the legend is, and glad he said legend, is that because poor Ho Shang, you know, it's like, you know, we got rid of this guy, but he's left his shoes behind, indicating that, you know, his wrong views are going to remain. And, you know, we wish he had taken these smelly shoes with him. Um, okay, the legend that representatives of the two sides of the issue met at Samye, the first uh, monastery built in Tibet in the year 792. The agreement was that the debate would settle the question for the future of Tibetan Buddhism, that the system of the winner would become the standard in Tibet, and the losing side would be forbidden to spread its doctrines. Remember last Friday we were talking about the Maha uh, Vihara and the Jetavana and the Abhayagiri, yeah, and how the Maha Vihara suppressed the other two. But it doesn't seem like they had a debate about it. It was just basically the power of the king. Uh -huh. Okay, the Indian side was represented by the monk Kamala Shila, and the Chinese side was represented by the monk Hashang Mahayana, which just means Chinese abbot, Mahayana abbot. The story goes that when Kamala Shila, an experienced debater, first saw Hashang Mahayana, the Chinese monk made a gesture that let Kamala Shila know that he would be a worthy opponent in debate. I don't know what the gesture was. Also, according to the legend, after the debate was settled in favor of the Indian approach and the Chan teachers were made to leave Tibet, Hashang Mahayana and his companions left in a hurry and he left behind a single shoe. This was interpreted to, by all the people who, debate, who believe in debate and logic. <laughs> This was interpreted to mean that there would be some remnant of the Chan teachings that would remain in Tibet. Yeah? So this is always something that, that really amazes me. Um, you know, when you sit with the people studying philosophy and they will debate and insist on reason, reasoning, reasoning, reasoning. And then you get to Tantra and it's, faith. You just want the blessings of the guru and you have faith and that's it. Yeah? And um, even though Tsongkhapa and many others uh, you know, like they wrote the, you know, the um, like a Lam Rim, it's called Nag Rim, you know, the gradual path of Tantra. And they explained all these things, view, you know, logic, using logic and reasoning and things like that. But the way people mostly approach it is, you know, now you have faith in the deity, faith in the guru, and so it's very interesting, you know. And hold on, and in um, yeah, in in staying some time in in the south, uh, having <laughs> having. Uh, people listening to people debate, you know, reasoning, reasoning, and you know, and it's such a lively thing. And then have a discussion about spirits and and how 
you know, maybe the, you know, what happened in Tibet was due, and I've heard this, this is a reason for the, the uh, what happened to Buddhism in Tibet, was because the, um, the gods who were protecting China and the gods who were protecting Tibet had a conflict. And that was why China invaded Tibet and destroyed so many monasteries. So it's so, it's fascinating to me, you know, a culture that's just so unreasoning. And then just like that, have, you know, other beliefs that, you know, they were raised with and they take for granted and make complete sense to them. And then somebody like me comes from outside and says, why do you believe in that? And they think you're kind of nuts. Yeah. So it's, so it's very interesting. I mean, studying human beings is so interesting. I was actually advised not to talk about, uh, like, uh, karma in terms of the Tibetans. Like, it's not very skillful uh-huh. to talk about the experiences of what has happened as, you know, karma ripening, that, you know, negative karma ripening, and then you're experiencing these negative results. Uh, the, the explanation was not all Tibetans actually understand karma in that mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. So it's not very skillful to put it out there. You be careful who you talk in this way to, to yeah. especially the Tibetans. Yeah, because it sounds like you're putting the Tibetans down when you talk like that. Yeah, it sounds like you're saying, oh, well, why did Buddhism get to, you know, um, destroyed? It's because they had created so much negative karma. So therefore, you know, they're not all they appear to be. Somebody could, uh, you know, deduce that. That's not correct. It's not a correct view of karma. But somebody could easily think that if they don't understand karma. And that question is asked a lot by Westerners, actually. You know, how do you explain what happened to the Tibetans from the viewpoint of karma? Yes, who you ask. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people have their own national pride. It seems like there's a certain um, skillfulness in talking about karma in that way in general. If if I get cancer and I think, oh, this is my karma right here. Mm-hmm. But if someone else gets cancer and I say, that's your karma right here. <laughs> no, that's not skillful. No. It's the same way. His yeah. Holiness may talk about this is the karma of the Tibetan people. Yeah. But that's more equivalent to me talking about if I, my illness being my result, the right. result of my karma. Yeah. Not someone else talking yeah. about Yeah. Yeah. I've made a couple of big boo-boos uh, regarding that. Um, I was at, was it Syracuse University? Remember when the Pan Am flight crashed over Lock, Lockerbie, Ireland, Ireland, Scotland. Yeah. And I was, I went to that school a few months after it and it was just a, you know, a general open discussion. And some people said, you know, okay, from a Buddhist viewpoint, why did this happen? And I started explaining karma and then I realized children that was not very skillful because these people had friends and relatives who had died in the crash and to them the explanation of karma sounded like you were saying that they they deserved to die because they had done something negative yeah another time i was speaking to a jewish group they asked me about the holocaust so I will never, I have learned my lesson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that when people are grieving, they may say, why did this happen? But that's not really what they want to know. They don't really want to know why did this happen. What they're saying is, tell me 
something, please, that will help me deal with my sorrow and my grief. That's what they're really saying. So we have to also be astute. When do people really want an answer to their question? And when does that question mean something else? And then we need to answer the something else. Okay. So we are on choosing your debate partner for this course. Oh, no. Then we're going to go pick. Remember, pick who our debate partners are. You remember in grammar school when you, people got picked for different sports teams? Yeah. How many of you were, at the, you know, among the last people picked? <laughs> How many of you were the first people picked? Oh, you'll never know what it's like. Oh, how traumatic it is that people don't want you on their game for playing dodgeball. <laughs> Remember dodgeball? Yeah. So this is, you know, real traumatic in grammar school. Yeah, you, you got picked early. You don't know what it's like. Yeah. Yeah. What about volleyball? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So some of us, you know, we, we were Klutz Incorporated. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, choosing your debate partner, we won't make it like, Choosing the teams for for dodgeball and volleyball and and everything like that. <laughs>